you a question this morning. Do you have a struggle with yourself? Well, if we search the scriptures this morning, we will find the keys that Christ also struggled with self and had to die to self. Now that may come as a shock to some of us, but here is the evidence. We want to ask the question, how early in Jesus' life and in his ministry, when he was a teenager perhaps, how early did he have a struggle to die to self? And then how later in his life, how much later did he continue to have a struggle to die to self? I think this search will be more rewarding to us than any lottery ticket win. So here is what we find. At the age of 12, Jesus dies to self. When he says in Luke chapter 2 verse 49, I must be about my father's business, he said. So just what was the father's business? Well, Jesus was to be the lamb slain from the foundation of the world, wasn't he? And so the father's business for Jesus was for him to be a lamb slain, to become a lamb to die for the world. At his baptism in the River Jordan, he told John the Baptist, Thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. And again, there we see a denial of self. So at the River Jordan, when he was baptized, he bears the cross already. He said in John chapter 5 and verse 30, I seek not mine own will. Do you remember that? I seek not mine own will. He says in his early ministry, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. Obviously, to seek not his own will, isn't that denying, to, denying of self? It certainly is. So maybe someone will be shocked by the idea that Jesus had a will of his own that needed to be denied in order for him to follow his Father's will. However, we read over and over again in the Bible opening up a reality of Jesus' youth that even our young people today desperately need to know about him is that over and over again Jesus had a struggle in denying self. He knew what self-denial meant. He said in John 6 verse 38, I came down from heaven not to do mine own will but the will of him that sent me. Can you imagine that? There it is. The Son of God took upon his sinless nature, our human nature, in his fallen condition where self had to die or he could never have followed his Father's will. So if Titus chapter 2 verse 11 in the New International Versions tells us to say no to ungodliness and worldly lusts, and if we must deny self, surely our Master has shown us the way, has he? by his own example of denial of self. And that is the secret that explains how Jesus took our fallen sinful nature and yet he did not sin. His life on earth was one ending series of denials of self. Well, what about later in his life? You know, sometimes we're uh, tempted to think as we look around in the congregation that those who are the older ones among us, the saints, who are the example for us, certainly they don't have any temptations anymore because they're beyond that. What about Jesus when he was older in his life, say in his late 20s or early 30s? Surely he didn't have to deny self then. But here is what we discover. He accepted the high priest's law in John 11 verse 50. It's interesting what the high priest said, which was a true fact. The priest said, it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. That was true. And Jesus chose to be that one man who died for the people. In Gethsemane, he prayed to his father, O oh, my father, not as I will, but as thou wilt. Matthew chapter 26 and verse 39. Self said to Jesus, don't throw your life away like this. Go back to heaven where you belong. 
These people down here on earth are not going to appreciate what you are doing for them. They're not going to appreciate what you are going through on your cross. You belong in heaven. But again, Jesus resisted that temptation. He denied self. Yes, and he bore his cross during all of his life, even in Gethsemane. And Calvary was just the final manifestation of Jesus' self-denial. Now, Scripture is clear that Christ must be perceived in his truth if sin is to be taken away from the world. <clears throat> in John 1.29, it says, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. <clears throat> Isaiah 45.22, Look unto me, and be ye saved all the ends of the earth. We are bidden there to look unto him. John 12, 32, Jesus says, I, if I be lifted up, an obvious reference to his cross, will draw all men unto me. Indeed, the glory, God's character, that is to lighten the earth with God's glory in the closing work of the gospel must of necessity be a revelation of the crucified Christ, the one who is the supreme denier of self because he alone is glory. It's not with physical eyesight. It's not with obvious physical eyesight that men and women are to behold Christ. The glory must be perceived through the eyes of faith. And it follows that the revelation of Christ is the clear and fully truthful word of faith which we preach. And that study of Christ is the answer to the problem. Jesus declared, I am the, what? The way, the truth, and the life. And such knowledge of Christ is not only theology, that is knowledge of God, the Father, but knowledge, too, about who we are as human beings as well. For Jesus said in John 15, 6, No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Christ's human nature. That's the bridge. That's the bridgehead that is so vital to a union of the divine nature, to our own fallen human nature. Christ is the way and his flesh, as Paul wrote in Hebrews 10.22, is the new and living way which he hath consecrated for us. Christ is truly the way to heaven, the way to the Father for us. It's not surprising, I suppose, that the enemy, Satan, has attempted to confuse us regarding the true Christ and has tried to mystify our faith in Christ. And it's directed primarily at this bridgehead of his real humanity. And so once the idea is injected into our understanding, however subtle it may be, that Christ's flesh was not the same as ours, that he did not know the same fight with temptation that we all struggle with, that then it is that his struggle becomes, his conflict becomes a meaningless abstraction, a conflict and yet no conflict, temptation and yet not what we know as temptation. Christ becomes a being without a relation to man and incapable of attracting his sympathy, his prayers to his Father for help. Scripture says, with strong crying and tears, if Christ did not fully experience the temptations and struggles and conflicts that we experience, that, those words would become melodrama, just meaningless. A fraud, and a fraudulent, fraudulent example to us, rather than his own desperately sincere appeal. Jesus' heart was breaking as he struggled with temptation to deny what he wanted in order to do what his father wanted. It's beyond 
the average Christian, including youth, to, to grasp what, that this example is more than a, an acted pre pretense. No firm bond of sympathy exists, and hence no sense of contrition is possible. We are urged to pray as Jesus did, but our hearts are blank without sympathy for the struggle that he went through in order to gain the victory over our temptations. And especially if we don't understand the struggles he went through, then the cross becomes mystified for us and obscured. An impenetrable mystery surrounds the very phase of Christ's work which was intended to appeal to human hearts. The cross, the Father's intent, was to open up our hearts in sympathy to Christ and have an intelligent drawing out of our souls to Jesus, in, that Jesus indeed has affected a reconciliation for us through his humanity, a reconciliation to God. And so, the true knowledge of Christ, the true Christ is intended to appeal to your heart. It's intended to, to appeal to my heart as well as to satisfy the legal matters that God has to deal with in terms of his law and his justice, as well as to appeal to our human logic. But it is also to reach our hearts in sympathy. As Ellen White puts it this way, the atonement of Christ was not made in order to induce God to love those whom he otherwise hated. It was not made to produce a love that was not in existence, but it was made as a manifestation of the love that was already in God's heart. The death of Christ was expedient in order that mercy might reach us with its pardoning power. And at the same time, that justice might be satisfied in the righteous substitute. Do you see the heart appeal in the atonement? Did Christ bear a relation to human sinful man that is capable of producing that dynamic, that motivating contrition which cleanses our hearts from all self? and egotism. Scripture says, Romans 8, 3, that he was, God sent him in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. How did Jesus condemn sin in the flesh? By coming in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, living a life of perfect righteousness in that flesh. His was a full identity with sinful man, but without sinning himself. Because of that, he condemned sin in the flesh. In other words, the atonement, the bridge between our humanity and the other world, the atonement stands or falls on whether or not that flesh that he took is our flesh. Whether or not his nature, which he took upon his sinless nature, was our human nature. Sinful nature, let us be clear about this, is not taking a sinning nature. When Jesus took our sinful nature, he did not take a sinning nature. A sinful nature does not require participating in sin. A sinful nature is necessarily one that part partic participates, is not, a sinful nature is not necessarily one that participates in sin, but which could participate or is able to participate in sin. But Christ took upon his sinless nature, says Ellen White, our sinful nature. Medical ministry, page 181, which is to say that Christ could have sinned. He could have sinned. The nature that he assumed was such that temptation to him was just as alluring just as strong as it is to us who participate in it. 
with the exception that Jesus had no passion for sin, he had no propensity to sin, which follows rather than precedes participation in sin. It is in this sense that Christ took or took a sinful nature while at the same time he was completely sinless. He's the glory of Christ's righteousness, which can be imputed and given or imparted to the sinner who believes. And to assert that Christ not only possessed a sinless nature, which is true, but also did not partake of our fallen sinful nature would be uh, to exempt him from the temptations of fallen men and limit his redemption and atonement to the one original sin in Adam. The definition of Christ's sinless and par sinlessness and participation in our sinful nature is expressed by the words of inspiration this way. It would have been an almost infinite humiliation for the Son of God to take man's nature even when Adam stood in his innocence in, in Eden. But Jesus accepted humanity when the race had been weakened by 4,000 years of sin. Like every child of Adam, he accepted the results of the working of the great law of heredity. What these results were is shown in the history of his earthly ancestors. He came with such a heredity to share our sorrows and temptations and to give us the example of a sinless life. Heredity is the sum of qualities and potentials derived from our ancestors through the mechanism of chromosomes, predilections, leanings, tendencies can be inherited only in that our weakened physical bodies are rendered more vulnerable to temptation. Sin or character is not transmitted through heredity and neither is righteousness inherited through our parents. Therefore Christ through the working of the great law of heredity did not inherit guilt or participation in sin and it is equally true that from his heavenly father he did not receive an inherent righteousness in his flesh or in his mind the fact is important for us to keep in mind because when the concept of the righteousness of Christ which is so frequently referred to in inspiration and in scripture is cited, the usual common idea are that Christ was inherently righteous and genetically made up so that he was incapable of sin. And both ideas are scientifically and scripturally unreasonable. Christ felt the strength of our temptations. And he had no advantage beyond ours. Says Ellen White, the in enmity referred to in the prophecy in Eden was not to be confined merely to Satan and the Prince of Life. It was to be universal. The enmity put between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman was supernatural. With Christ, the enmity was in one sense natural in another sense, it was supernatural, as humanity and divinity were combined. When we talk about our tendency to sin, inspiration does not mean a guilt or participation in sin. Natural tendencies make it easy for us to choose wrong pathways. But the tendencies are not the sinful choices themselves. Would it have been easy for Christ to sin? We should be exceedingly careful before we answer a hasty no. Aid is assured to us in overcoming hereditary leanings and tendencies, but are we sure that Christ was exempted from such overcoming 
If so, how in the world could we understand when Jesus records those words in the book of Revelation, chapter 3 and verse 21, is he says, to him that overcometh, even as I also overcame. There must be a very close parallel between Christ's overcoming and our overcoming. Remove from Christ the temptation from within, and we remove from him all of his practical relevance to us as fallen human beings. And that understanding is the very foundation of the monastic way of life. You see, in certain Protestant major, pardon me, major Christian circles, Christians are classified under two sorts. Those who are super holy and saints who follow the monastic way of life, and then there are the people who sit in the pews, and they can, they're exempted. They can go on sinning, just take the Mass so that they'll be cleared of their sinning. You see, monks isolate themselves from the surrounding world, and they live in cloisters so that they won't be tempted by the world. They, they live in a hermetically sealed vacuum, as it were, an environment sealed off from the world. And they think that this self-denial keeps them away from outside temptations, and so they can thus develop a righteous life easier. You know, if Jesus could be tempted only by stimulations from the world, from outside of him, perceived by outward physical senses, then really when Jesus was tempted there in the wilderness, especially that third temptation in the wilderness, it would lose its meaning. Because it was obvious in that third temptation that Satan presented a vision to Christ's mind. Which vision Christ perceived. He saw through it in his mind. He, he didn't see it with his physical eyes. He understood it in his mind, that dream that was presented to him. Ellen White says this, Desire of Ages, page 129, that Satan caused the kingdoms of the world in all of their glory to pass in panoramic view before him. Powerful temptation to gain the world by a detour around the cross. You think that was a struggle for Jesus? Because the prince of this world claimed to be the, the ruler of the world. He says, I'll just give it all to you if you just bow down and worship me. He presented this to him as a temptation within his mind. You know, that goes to how we often daydream, doesn't it? And how when we daydream and we let our thoughts wander and we loosely cherish hatred in our minds maybe, or desires, or lusts, or greed, or covetousness, we may sin even though we dwell alone. Maybe all by ourselves in our home. That would be like a monk in the cloister or in the desert who has hermetically sealed themselves off from the world. Temptations arise from within us. That's the idea. Did Jesus struggle with such temptations? Absolutely sure. This third temptation of Jesus in the wilderness indicates that. Jesus was not exempt from that. Ellen White says in Testimonies to Ministers, page 259, Christians should not be controlled by tendencies, by leanings. If Christians have tendencies, but not, must not be controlled by them, it must be understood that tendencies are therefore the capacity and potential receptivity for temptation. A potential for sin if the sinful choice is made, but not sin without the sinful choice. If there is no choice to sin, they remain merely temptation. A thousand temptations resisted do not make one sin.
On the other hand, you have propensities and you have passions, and that's different. And they are known by all of us who have participated in sin. All of us who have participated in sin have passions and we have propensities to sin. Those are things Jesus did not have because he never participated in sin. They are known only by those who have participated in sin. And those propensities and passions follow the act of sin. For example, let me give you an illustration. Someone may have a definite tendency toward intemperance. Heaven only knows what a person would be, have been, were it not for Christ, who has redeemed you and me. Christ has kept us from many weaknesses and tendencies that we have, and we praise him for that grace. But the person who has a tendency toward intemperance does not have a propensity for intoxicating drinks because he never tasted them. But his tendency toward intemperance makes it imperative that he not begin tasting alcohol. Could Christ have drunk intoxicating beverages freely and safely? Could he? Could he have committed any sin only once? And here's the heart of the problem that demands our careful thought. Man cannot sin only once. Tendency that is indulged and chosen always triggers into a propensity for more. Had Christ yielded to even one sin, he would have repeated our transgression and the same process would have followed them over and over for him. And then, what is his relation to a tendency to a sinful potential? The only possible answer in the light of Scripture and the spirit of prophecy assertions, his capacity was identical to ours because Scripture says he came in the flesh. John writes that in his first epistle. Jesus came in the flesh. And that is the meaning of the phrase in the likeness of sinful flesh. He had the potential tendencies. But Christ established a complete and perfect identity with fallen man that he might be our perfect redeemer from those tendencies. Ellen White says we need to realize the truth of Christ's manhood in order to appreciate the truth of the above words, he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood. It was not a make-believe humanity that Christ took upon himself, she writes. He took human nature and he lived human nature. His divine nature knew what was in man. He needed not that any should testify to him of this. Wow! We have a Savior who knows exactly where we're at. He's near to us. He's experienced the fullness and intensity of sin. That even a sinner who has indulged in those tendencies cannot understand. Because divinity that is sinless experiences temptation into sin in a much more intense way than a sinner experiences it. Here's what she says. Christ's overcoming and obedience is that of a true human being. In our conclusions, we make mistakes because of our erroneous views of the human nature of our Lord. When we give to his human nature a power that is not possible for man to have in his conflicts with Satan, we destroy the completeness of his humanity. He came not to our world to give the obedience of a lesser God to a greater, but as a man to obey God's holy law. And in this way, he is our example. The Lord Jesus Christ came to our world not to reveal what a God could do, 
but what a man could do through the faith in God's power to help in every emergency. Seventh Bible Commentary, page 929. Again, inspiration records this. His mind, like yours, could be harassed and perplexed. Jesus was exposed to hardships, to conflict and temptation as a man. Again, our high calling, that was our high calling, page 57. Again, on page 59, Jesus was sinless and had no dread of the consequences of sin. With this exception, his condition was as yours. We need not place the obedience of Christ by itself as something for which he was particularly adapted. If he had a special power, which it is not the privilege of man to have, Satan would have made capital of this matter. So here is the true Christ. Here is the eyes of faith that we need to behold the true knowledge of Christ, who is practical and relevant to the needs of you, dear sinner, on this earth to every sinner who is on this earth. Here is the heart appeal of our Savior who is preciously near to us in this regard. Here is the Christ who is worthy of our contemplation, who arouses in our hearts contrition and faith that can dissipate lukewarmness and complacency. Here is the Christ who engages our interest, who elicits our human sympathy because the reality that he has in terms of kinship with us is clarified. Christ's battle is the battle of every sinner with self. And he has given us this loving promise that is so relevant to him that overcometh. Will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame? When Paul writes in Galatians that Christ was made under the law, it was not merely in the sense of him subjecting himself to the Jewish ceremonial laws and rites that aren't binding upon us, but made under the law meant in the sense of being under the conditions of our human finiteness that put pressures on us, to self-seeking, we all know that. Paul says he was made under the law as he was made to be sin for us, but he did not yield to sin. He did not surrender to the impelling force of self-seeking, but he knew the strength, as it were, of being thrown into the American River, if you please, and being pulled under by the undertow. He knew the strength of that undertow. As you know, the pulling strength of the undertow of temptation in your life. He was born in the river which sweeps us into sin, and yet he stood firm as a rock in the middle of that river, Amen. unmoved. Amen. Christ had a self. We've read that. John 5.30, 6.38, Matthew 26.39. But what distinguishes him from us as regards his overcoming was that the principle of the cross was operative in his whole experience from the age that he was accountable, let's say 12, to the final cry of victory when he said, It is finished. Amen. He pleased not himself. Someone says, well, just hold on here a minute. Jesus, Jesus couldn't be tempted to selfishness, could he? We don't want to make him too human, do we? And in response, we just need to note, in summary, to, de to be tempted is not the same as to sin. By the way, you have that in James chapter 1 there, later on in the chapter that we just was reading there. Temptation is not sin. A thousand temptations do not equal one sin. Therefore, Jesus could, in all points, be tempted like as we are, yet not ever once 
give in to commit a sin. It seems to me that we might be confusing temptation with sin, making temptation and, a, and sin equivalent to one another. It is possible to be tempted and yet not sin. And that is abundantly demonstrated in Scripture. Our first parents, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden, did not need to yield to the serpent's temptation. Christ was tempted by the devil in the wilderness there, in Matthew chapter 4. He did not yield to those temptations. Joseph was tempted by the alluring Potiphar's wife, and yet, by the grace of the Savior and through faith in Him, Joseph resisted. Amen. And according to the New International Version, it is possible to say no to ungodliness and worldly lust, to deny self. It's very true. Christ knew no sin, but that does not mean that He knew no temptation to sin. To equate temptation with sin is to destroy the reality of his connection with us as human beings. Hebrews 4.15 says that he was in all points tempted like as we are, not merely like as Adam was tempted. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same that he might succor or aid them that are tempted. You see, Jesus cannot save what he has not assumed. Nor can he reach those to whom he has not come near. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. And that does not mean that he must indulge in our sin. It only means that he must know the strengths of our temptation in order to aid us who are tempted to in any way separate from sinners. Christ does not require an immaculate conception like the majority of Christians believe so that he is disconnected from the human race. The con there is a statement in Hebrews that says of his priestly ministry that he is holy, harmless, undefiled, in that he never yielded to temptation. For us, sin dwelleth in me, writes the Apostle Paul, that is true, but sin never dwelt in Jesus. Holy, harmless, undefiled. He was made under the law. His own words are an inspired commentary on Paul's phrase. He took on his sinless nature, our sinful nature, that he might know how to aid them that are tempted, in that he took a self as we have a self, a self that needed to be denied, to be crucified. We've said he bore the cross all of his life. He bore it, not only on Calvary's hill. He could not follow his Father's will unless he denied his own will. He tells us so very plainly. Christ was totally unselfish. But unselfishness implies resistance of the temptation to be selfish. Whereas he always denied self, we have yielded to self. And we are selfish. Christ's righteousness is infinitely greater than Adam's sinlessness. Jesus did for sure become human. We don't want to limit his humanity, for John tells us that if we do so, we end up being Antichrist. 1 John chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. He was in all things made like unto his brethren. His name is Emmanuel, God with us. Humanity combined with divinity. We must remember that the humanity which Christ became, himself to be, was not the sinless, unfallen humanity of Adam in Eden. He came from heaven specifically to solve the problem of sin, where it dwells in fallen sinful nature. 
if he sidesteps taking that same humanity where the problem is for all of us he opens himself up to the charge of being unfair in the contest with evil and who in the world who in, who among us would believe that we would have such a dishonest savior we need to remember that temptation to indulge self was as strong for him as it is for us in fact it was stronger nobody could have more fervently abhorred being crucified than was Jesus his whole soul shrunk from the ordeal of crucifixion you listen to him pray oh my father if it be possible let this cup pass from me you think that was a sweet little prayer no sir that was an agonizing prayer he screamed he shook like in, in an earthquake David says he cried out in Psalm 22 1 he sweat actual drops of blood and that perfect likeness of his nature with yours and mine his humanity being formed with a self as is ours a self which had to be denied if he should follow his father's will all of this makes Jesus our perfect Savior able to save perfectly those who come unto God by him Hebrews 7 25 when you are tempted to say to yourself I'm bad is the Lord in me now I believe the Lord was with me in that very enthusiastic exciting meeting that I participated in some time ago everybody there was happy that day what a joyous occasion when we made our promises to the Lord but now here I am a month later and I'm feeling very depressed and all alone and forsaken and everything seems to be going wrong and the enemy is tempting me and I feel as though the Lord has left me and by and by when that temptation passes and I feel a little bit better and as though the Lord is with me I will confess it then but folks it is in that very midst of that trial that we need him in us Amen. we need him with us Amen. it was the same for him in the temptation in the wilderness he was weakened by fasting his appearance was more marred than any man and his form more than the sons of men he was a wanderer in the desert and the devil comes up to him and he says you do not look so much like the Son of God and he comes as an angel of light and he tries to make out Christ as an imposter you do not look so much like the Son of God and he says if you are the Son of God then you are the Creator you created everything why don't you take those stones out there and satisfy your hunger and Christ knew that he could have done it he knew that he could have done it he knew that he was the Son of God in the wilderness just as when he was the Son of God at the Last Supper and he washed the feet of the disciples as a very humble one he knew that he was coming from God and that he went to God but he held to the Word of God all through his temptations in the wilderness and he confessed and he declared the name of the Lord and he witnessed a good confession that is what it means to confess that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh in your flesh it does not mean on certain occasions when you are having a nice wave of enthusiasm and glory sweeping over you as with the rest of the congregation that you confess that Jesus is Lord and we are moved in spite of our old selves there it is just so as much when we are physically helpless 
It is just so true when the enemy is pressing upon us with his temptations that Jesus is Lord with us. It is as much so when afflictions are pressing against us as when all is very pleasant and clear and happy going. To confess Christ is to hold the Word of God as true continually in all circumstances. And the value of confessing is confessing it in the heart. Believe in thine heart. This word shall be in thine heart. And do not let the enemy snatch that away from you. It is only by this fixed knowledge through his word that God is with us that we can ever resist any temptation. And so when the enemy comes in like a flood, let the Spirit of the Lord lift up the standard against him in your heart and say with the Apostle Paul, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, ego, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Galatians 2.20 Keep the faith of Jesus and the victory is yours. There was a time when a fellow in his business was experiencing recession. He lost his job. He lost a sizable fortune. He lost his beautiful home. And to add to his sorrow, his precious wife died. And yet, he tenaciously held to faith. The only thing that he had left. One day when he was walking out in search of employment, he stopped to watch some men who were doing some stonework on a large church. And one of them was chiseling a triangular piece of rock. And he asked, what are you going to, where are you going to put that piece of rock? And the workman said, do you see that little opening up there near the spire, the top? Well, I am shaping this stone down here so that it will fit in up there. And tears filled his eyes as he walked away, for the Lord had spoken to him through that laborer whose words gave new meaning to his troubled situation. Are you having a battle with self? So did Jesus. Have you ever given in to self? Jesus did not. But the reason why he ever liveth is to give you and me forgiveness and victory. And there's no time when one would naturally feel less that the Lord is with him or her than when being sorely tempted. But that is the very time when we must know and confess 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God.